Uh, welcome everyone, hello, welcome to this New Israel Fund Australia event with New York Times columnist and author Roger Cohen. Uh, my name is Liam Gatroy. I'm the Executive Director of the New Israel Fund in Australia. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to the Elders past and present. Uh, we're lucky to have in Australia Roger Cohen as our guest. He's one of the most eminent foreign affairs columnists today. I know many of you, like me, will have been reading Roger's dispatches from across the world for many years, and we're looking forward to hearing some of his insights about Israel and Palestine, about global Jewish affairs, and some of his impressions on Australia. He's already filed a column about some of his initial thoughts, which I'm sure many of you have read as well. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, what NIF is and, and welcome those who are here at an NIF event for the first time. Uh, we, we began in Australia less than five years ago, but we're part of a global partnership of Israelis and diaspora Jews that began almost 40 years ago and that centers on fulfilling the vision of Israel's Declaration of Independence of working towards a Jewish and democratic state that embraces equality and justice is inclusive for all, regardless of gender, religion, or ethnicity. Over the last 40 years, NIF has partnered with more than 1,000 organizations across the religious, social, and political spectrum to give out more than $400 million worth of grants. Our partners work variously to strengthen democratic infrastructure and protect human rights, using public advocacy and strategic litigation in order to ensure total equality in Israel for all minorities, like Arab citizens of Israel, refugees and people seeking asylum, and Ethiopians, to protect freedom of speech and to ensure government transparency and accountability. We work to advance social and economic justice, working for an equitable distribution of national resources, particularly into towns in Israel's periphery, access to public housing and better outcomes for all people in Israel, particularly Mizrahi and Ethiopian Jews. We work to promote religious pluralism and tolerance by eroding the rabbinate, the ultra-Orthodox rabbinate's monopoly over Jewish life, things like marriage and divorce. We work to strengthen moderate Orthodox groups and oppose the exclusion of women from the public sphere. We work to empower Palestinian Israeli society. As 20% of Israel's population, it's underrepresented in the political system. It suffers from a lack of investments in healthcare, education, and transport. And our work ensures Arab Israelis have equality not just in law, but also on the ground. We work to combat racism and strengthen shared society, bringing Jews and Arabs, religious and secular, Ashkenazim and Sfaradim together to oppose extremism, to widen the range of voices who speak against racism, and to build shared projects on the local level that foster tolerance. And we also are developing a new set of programs that provide the backbone of Israeli civil society for the next 50 years. An Israeli version of Get Up recently launched called Zazim, which promotes grassroots campaigning. The Council for Peace and Security is another. Many of you will have met Colonel Shaul Arieli last year, which ensures strong, respected, and moderate voices on national security uh, from Israel's top military echelon are heard in the public discourse. A lot of this will be in the brochure that was on your seats as you walked in. The other part of our work is in Australia, creating conversations like this one with Roger, creating a space where our community can come together to discuss these important issues. People like Roger, come to our community and help us develop a deeper connection to Israel. They help us understand more about what's happening on the ground. Another thing we're doing locally is a program called the Nomi Chazan Fellowship, and we have some of our past and present and future fellows in the audience here, which is investing in the future of the Jewish community by empowering young people to visit Israel, be immersed in the human rights and social justice movement, and come back and lead a new, more liberal conversation about Israel in the Jewish community. Many of you may also have seen The Other Haggadah, which was a project by two of our fellows, which we, re which, which we released just before Pesach, and which brought stories of the other in Israel and tied them together with the Pesach themes of freedom and justice. The brochure on your chair that you may also have seen was for a TV documentary we're showing in September called The Silver Platter, Magash HaKesef. Uh, we still like to think of Israel as a very egalitarian society, but unfortunately, the opposite is more and more true. Uh, it's actually one of the most socially and economically divided countries in the OECD today. And there's, it's largely as a result of neoliberal economic policies, which are very common throughout the world, and as a result, too many Israelis are being left behind. So Magash HaKesef is really a gripping and dramatic story on the subject, and more than a million and a half Israelis watched it in Israel last year, and we're bringing that to theatres in September. So I hope you'll come and see that. We love, at NIF, we love Israel deeply. We know, though, that it must change course in order to protect the Zionist dream of a democratic, 
homeland for the Jewish people. We're committed to being part of Israel's story, just as diaspora Jews have been since the earliest days of the Zionist movement. And we're working together to build the equal, just, and democratic state that was envisioned by its founders. Uh, we're very grateful that many of you have chosen to join our movement over the last five years. Thousands of people have come to our events. We've raised more than $2 million in Australia, which we're very excited about. And we're helping to shape a new and more moderate conversation about Israel in the community. Uh, before we launch in, I just want to say uh, two very quick things. One is that at the end of the hall, you entered a bathroom, so you can use them as you wish. Uh, but also after the event, Roger will be signing his book, The Girl from Human Street. Uh, so after the event, if you make your way out, uh, you can purchase a book and then have it signed after. So thank you again, everyone, for coming. Uh, and I want to ask Stephen Glass, who's NIF's Vice President, to come up. Uh, thanks, Liam, and uh, I, my, uh, I add my welcome to everybody here tonight. I know you don't want to hear me. You've come to hear Roger, who's travelled all the way from the United States, but I just wanted to say just a couple of words, my thoughts, um, about the importance of NIF. Um, and I want to start by reflecting on um, the um, Pesach Haggadah, which uh, we all read a few weeks ago, and you might think that that's a sort of an odd thing for a confirmed old secular Jew like me to be uh, reflecting on, a religious book. Um, but um, each time we celebrate um, Seder at our place, there are two things that um, come through uh, the evening for me. The first is um, that we're enjoined, each of us, to consider ourselves as, as if we ourselves had left Egypt. And that's a message to me of um, empathy, empathy for people suffering privation and hardship and persecution. And the second thing is that we're told we need to welcome the stranger because we have to remember that we were once strangers in Egypt. And um, that's a message of generosity and accepting of other people. To me, the reason why those things are important is because they reflect quintessentially Jewish values. And one of the things that we often hear in these difficult times uh, in the Middle East and, and in Israel is that in order to protect uh, Israel's uh, Jewish nature, uh, it has to maybe think about sacrificing some of its Jewish, uh, sorry, some of its democratic values. But what I think about that is that as soon as we start playing with those democratic values, the ones that are reflected in uh, Israel's Decla Declaration of Independence, we also lose those quintessentially Jewish values, those values of empathy and of welcoming and being generous to others. I think it's a false dichotomy. I think Israel is there to be a Jewish and a democratic state, and it can't be one without the other. We here don't vote in Israel, most of us, and um, can't really change the politics of things. But what we can do, and the mission of MI, what the mission of NIF is to do, is to keep alive these values on the ground. And we do it in the ways that Liam talked about. And there's been a number of sort of important recent developments. So, for example, an NIF grantee is currently working to ensure that um, Jewish and Palestinian babies in Kfar Saba maternity ward um, are not segregated. There are NIF grantees who are working to, in, to eliminate uh, racism from uh, Israeli sports. Uh, and uh, one NIF grantee recently won a court case uh, ensuring that additional playgrounds will be built in the Palestinian neighbourhoods of Jerusalem, which at the moment, on a per capita basis, Jewish neighbourhoods have 30 times more playgrounds for children than Palestinian neighbourhoods. So my view about the importance of NIF is that these activities on the ground are keeping alive the Jewish democratic dream of the State of Israel, and it's really important to do that for the next year, until the next election, perhaps until multiple elections, perhaps another 30 or 40 years, until the politics changes, and it will change sooner or later. And when it does, it's important that infrastructure and those values are alive on the ground. So before I introduce uh, Roger, let me just remind you that on your seats and hopefully now in your hands are not only the colourful brochure with some of the description of the work that NAF does, but there's also this blue card. And I'd really encourage you to help keep that dream alive, to help us build from the two million that we've already raised here in Australia and um, donate uh, generously. Take the card home, think about how much you want to give, maybe add a zero on the end, and then um, send it in. Now, um, 
If I could just introduce, our, uh, introduce Roger, I don't think he needs terribly much introduction, but um, uh, very briefly, Roger uh, is currently a columnist for the New York Times. He's worked for the New York Times for 25 years, initially as a foreign correspondent, then foreign editor, and now columnist. Before that, he worked for the Wall Street Journal and for Reuters. He's the author of four books, one of which, most recent of which, is the one that uh, Liam just mentioned to you, The Girl from Human Street, Ghosts of Memory in a Jewish Family. It was published to wide acclaim by Alfred Knopf in January 2015. He's taught at Harvard and Princeton, and his work has been recognised with a number of awards, including a Lifetime Achievement Award from Britain's Next Century Foundation and a prize from the Overseas Press Club of New York. He was raised in South Africa and England. He's a graduate of Balliol College, Oxford, and he's now a naturalised American. Please welcome Roger. Roger is going to hold a conversation with Michaela Kolofsky. Michaela is an interviewer and facilitator. She's conducted radio show interviews for the ABC on Radio National's music show, Big Ideas, and on Classic FM and ABC local radio. She's facilitated panels for the Sydney Writers' Festival, the Sydney Film Festival, the Sydney Jewish Writers' Festival, and All About Women at the Sydney Opera House. She's interviewed writers and thinkers from the world of arts, science, and politics. Some of her highlight interviews include Amos Oz, Thomas Keneally, that would have been good, um, Daniel Mendelssohn, Robin Davidson, Emile Sherman, Anthony Horowitz, Joanna Murray, Smith, and Laura Marling. Michaela worked for many years in the film industry and as a music supervisor uh, for the films Romulus, My Father, and Balibo, two terrific Australian movies. She holds an arts law degree from the University of New South Wales. Michaela also works as a researcher and producer on Margaret Throsby's uh, interview program on ABC Classic FM. And she was a writer and producer on the SBS political interview series, The Observer Effect. Um, can I introduce Michaela and invite Michaela and Roger to come to the interview. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Stephen, for those introductions. Um, we'll get to jump right in. Firstly, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. If you've got a mobile phone, just make sure it's switched to silent now. That would be great. Um, and what we'll do is I'll have a conversation with Roger for about 30 minutes, 35, and leave at least 15 minutes for your questions at the end. So please keep them in mind as we're going along, and we'll be sure to fit in as many as we can. Roger, I read your memoir, and you weren't born with a strong sense of Jewish identity. Um, it's something that you've had to find for yourself. And I wondered if you could start, for those people who haven't read the book, if you could tell us a bit about what you did to try and understand your identity. Well, thank you, Michaela. Um, I must say, uh, just arriving here, to be beneath a full moon at Bondi Beach and talking about uh, Israel, Palestine and Jewish identity seems somehow inappropriate. It's such a beautiful setting for a sometimes painful subject. But anyway, here we are, and thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, my parents were immigrants uh, in Britain. They were uh, from South Africa. Um, my family were uh, wandering Jews of the 20th century. Um, trees have roots, Jews have legs. Uh, they, they moved from, my forebears moved from Lithuania uh, to South Africa and then on to Britain. I was born in Britain, uh, then we went back to South Africa for two years, and then uh, I, the, my father didn't like apartheid at all and hated it, and, and they left. Uh, but the goal uh, in Britain was very much um, assimilation, um, not to the point of changing our name. Indeed, before the family left South Africa, a cousin of my father's told him, you really must change your name, you know, you won't get anywhere being called Cohen in Britain. He said, oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, you must change your name. So my dad said, well, I'll go away and think about it. And um, he did. And a few days later, went back to see her. And she said, so, darling, what did you decide? Tell us. He said, well, you're right. I've been thinking about it. I'm going to change my name. That's wonderful. What are you going to change it to? Einstein. <laughs> and that was the end of that um, discussion. But I was raised... Um, yeah, our Jewishness was not part of my upbringing at all. In fact, I probably first became really aware of my Jewishness 
at school when I was about 12 or 13, when I encountered, I was called an effing year a few times, and started thinking about what it is um, to be a Jew, and um, as I grew older, um, my Jewish identity, and the whole question of where I came from, I said we were immigrants, that word was never used. Um, I was lucky um, to have a very privileged upbringing, and I would sit in Westminster Abbey every morning uh, at school, and there is no greater center of continuity than Westminster Abbey. William the Conqueror was coronated there in 1066, and I, two generations away from the shtetl, was sitting there with very little awareness of that shtetl background. Uh, I don't think that was that uncommon in the post-war years. I think there was uh, a prudence that invited silence. There was also perhaps a degree of shame uh, in having survived. Why were you there as a Jew when six million others were not? Um, and um, so discovering my Jewish identity and my forebears, where we'd come from, was, was a voyage that I guess I undertook most thoroughly um, in this book. In the book as well, you, you write about growing up in a house, um, in a house of silence, really, that there were so many things that were unspoken. And I wondered if you could talk a bit about how that shaped not just the man you became, but also the journalist you became. Well, I've certainly learned in, in my uh, career as a journalist, I found myself in several war zones. Um, Notably, I covered the wars in Yugoslavia, in Bosnia, the, the wars of Yugoslavia's destruction. I was in Beirut in the 80s after the Marines got blown up. Um, and um, I think every conflict uh, that I've covered, there's a degree of suppressed memory. Um, events of the past are suppressed and then a nationalist leader comes along and whips up uh, the resentments of the past um, using myth about events that have never been clarified. Certainly that was true in Yugoslavia where the events of World War II which degenerated into a civil war among all the Yugoslavs. But when Tito came along that was never talked about again and it erupted when the lid of communism came off. And in my own house, um, so it's dangerous to suppress memory. It can be very painful to discover what has happened, um, there are reasons why things get suppressed, but in my own family, my mother um, had, after being plucked out of a very close-knit and newly prosperous uh, Jewish community in Johannesburg, in Houghton, uh, my great-grandfather Isaac Michael had arrived penniless from Lithuania, and he became a co-founder of the OK Bazaars, which are like the Macy's. I don't know what the equivalent in Australia would be, but the big department store, what would that be here? I don't know. Uh, Maya. Maya, OK. Maya well, so he was a co-founder of the OK Bazaars, and uh, he had a large property in Houghton, which became known as Chateau Michael. My parents met there on the tennis court in 1949. And so my mother was raised in this cocoon of new South African wealth. and. Um, as a young woman in her 20s, she was plucked out of this and plonked down in post-war London under those dirty bathwater skies of London that you don't seem to get much of here in Sydney. And, um, you know, putting coins in the meter uh, for hot water and a uh, very hard-driving uh, husband um, making his career in medicine. And uh, my mother broke down. She cracked up. Um, she had what was then called post puerperal psychosis, now called postpartum depression. I was able to, in the course of researching my book, find fragments of her medical records, so I now know. Anyway, I know what happened to her, which I didn't know before, where she was, what happened to her. And, um, but this was never talked about in my family. It was, uh, it was a non-subject. So, uh, yeah, there were a lot of there were a lot of silences, and then um, I mean, I now know, for example, that on July 30, uh, 1958, three days before my third birthday, my mother was being taken into a room at the Holloway Institution, 
where she had electroconvulsive therapy or electric shock treatment, which in the 1950s was, I, I don't know if any of you have read Sylvia Plath's The Bell Jar, but uh, the way, or Ken Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, the way it was administered in the 1950s um, was a far cry from today. I mean, the jolt could be so violent as to dislocate limbs. And I found out these things about my mother, which obviously um, has been painful, uh, but it's more painful, at least for me, um, not to know. I mean, I, it, uh, you know, with this voyage of discovery has come at least a degree of acceptance. Um, so, yes, I... Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of my life writing about displaced people, um, people whose lives had been disrupted. Um, I was drawn to them. Uh, and then, at a certain point, you know, I was always going the other way from the crowd. The crowd was running away from Sarajevo or Beirut, and I was going in. And it, then it occurred to me that, you know, although my family had skirted the Holocaust, um, uh, I too, in my family, had known a lot of displacement, loss. In the United States, I'm now an American citizen, um, immigration, and I guess true of Australia. Um, you know, there must be an Australian dream. I mean, it's, it's, it's new hope, it's beginning again, it's uh, the American dream, the Australian dream. Um, but it's hard, you know, it's hard assimilating. What is assimilation? It's leaving something behind, it's loss, it's the reconstruction of identity. And in my mother's case, um, I think that was part of what overwhelmed her. And she was a transplant who didn't quite take in Britain. She always yearned for South Africa and went back there at the end of her life as much as she could. And in the book I compare her after what happened to a tree hollowed out by lightning. I think uh, she was full of love, but it was hard for her to give it. I want to go back to Britain, if we can. Yeah. Because you write very, it's, it's very amusing as well in the book, even though it's serious. That well, I'm glad there's some lighter passages. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I no, it is, I, no, yeah, I don't, there are. It's, it's, it's a book which has quite a lot of darkness, but I hope there is also upliftment and lighter passages and and my mother was was full of love i mean love is also a message of the book i hope but back in britain if you could talk a little bit about the idea that there's a you describe a certain kind of british anti-semitism that's different to other forms what was that well you know lewis namia speaks of the trembling israelites of britain and philip roth uh, writes about jews in a whisper and I remember my mother, when I was about 14, sitting in a restaurant in St. John's Wood in North London, an Italian restaurant. And my mother always used to cut her spaghetti, which, um, of course, would appall any Italian. But um, she, and she pointed across the restaurant and she said, darling, you see those people over there? They're Jewish. I said, mom, why are you whispering? She said, I, she said I'm not whispering, but they're Jewish. And, and um, you know, I think the deal, you know, the deal in England and Britain always seemed to me that, I mean, Jews are very successful. In Britain, there's probably not a better European country for Jews to live in in Britain. Uh, there's a community of quarter of a million Jews, a little more. Uh, but the, the deal seemed to me to be, you kept reasonably quiet about it. If there was a comment like, oh, that's so Jewish, you know, meaning uh, that... Uh, you'd been uh, mean or miserly in some way, or you know, you just kind of pretend you hadn't heard it, or comments about a great conch of a nose, or you know, you just sort of okay, this was sort of just mild flotsam on a generally benign sea, and you could, um, it was not the annihilationist anti Semitism of continental Europe. Um, so, for many Jews who came to Britain, um, it wasn't a bad deal, um, and I can see that. But I had no notion that Jewishness could be lived boisterously, openly, with, with pride and without reducing uh, one's conversation to a whisper. And that discovery really came in New York, and it's an important part of why I chose um, to become an American. Indeed, when I went back 
to London, um, as I did um, for about five years. I'd been away for a long time as a foreign correspondent and living in New York and elsewhere. And, and I went back and, in 2010 and, uh, and I was using a Blackberry and um, this lodger at my sister's house um, said to me, and these are, you know, there were several comments, you grow totally unused to this in America, but he said, oh, I see you have a Jewberry. And I said, oh, great, you what? Yeah, Jewberry. I said, no, I'm sorry, I have no idea what you're talking about. And he said, um, I don't know how many of you had Blackberries or maybe even still have them, but there was something called Blackberry Messenger, which is just a way of sending messages between, known as BBM, between Blackberry. So he said, well, um, you know, Blackberry Messenger, BBM. I said, I'm sorry, Craig, I still don't get it. Uh, you know, what about BBM? And he said, well, it's free. And um, I just, you know, I, you just don't, I mean, you do hear those kinds of comments are still, I don't want to overplay this, overdo it. As I said, uh, you can spend many years in Britain as a Jew and uh, do very well, extremely well, um, even become prime minister. And, uh, uh, but um, I did not feel there, w there was always a slight um, unease. And one of the things I discover in the book is that everywhere my family was, I mean, Lithuania, obviously the pogroms. In South Africa, you know, every year my family would be saying, enjoy it, next year the pools will be red with blood. I mean, the blacks were going to rise out of the horizon from those dusty, miserable, awful townships where they were persecuted under a cruel system and they were going to come and claim what was theirs. And, uh, and then this slight unease in, in Britain and my great uncle, uh, I discovered, also in the had been a, a rabbi and he was, the, was called the chaplain to Jewish soldiers during World War II and he would go around the battlefields of Flanders and elsewhere administering last rites to young British Jewish soldiers who died in battle. And his diaries that I found at the University of Southampton had his letter and, and letters. Um, I mean, there were passages that were extraordinary that he wrote in 1918. And it was all, you know, have we at last proved and demonstrated to the crown and the empire through our sacrifice that we Jews are loyal subjects uh, of Britain? Um, and you could feel that still, that anxiety of, of separateness, of, of otherness, even after the deaths of thousands of Jews. And of course, in Britain, um, things turned out relatively okay. But uh, the fact that as a German Jew, you had an iron cross for your bravery on the Somme in uh, 1915 did not save you from the gas in 1943. So that anxiety was extremely well placed. Half admission to Christian society in Europe, the emergence from the shtetl after the French Revolution and through the 19th century proved much more dangerous in the end than non-acceptance because it challenged the established patterns of European society. I want to bring you to something that we grapple with in Australia, which is that we experience anti-Semitism here and we experience anti-Israel sentiment. And sometimes those two phrases get used interchangeably. Mm. And I wondered if you could help us a bit or just talk about the difference between them, in your opinion. Well, you also experience anti-refugee sentiment, as I've uh, discovered since I got here with that. I haven't put together in my mind this very laid-back country and that very ferocious outburst, so you'll have to help me understand that um, at some point. Um, look, in theory, they're distinct. You can be opposed to Israeli policies, um, uh, even to the existence of a Jewish state of Israel, um, and not be an anti-Semite. I mean, that, that is, seems to me to be obvious. The issue is that the line between them uh, can become uh, very, very fine. And I think um, the vehemence and the peculiar concentration on Israel of forms of anti-Zionism uh, today um, uh, go very, very close or 
in some cases certainly over the line, I would say, uh, into anti-Semitism. Um, there's a term going around on campuses in Britain uh, that is borrowed directly from the Ku Klux Klan. Um, Jewish students in British and some American universities are being uh, called Zios, Z-I-O, I don't know if that word has come to Australia, but, um, uh, you know, this is anti-Semitism. I mean, it's borrowed uh, from the uh, anti-Semitic uh, uh, dictionary. And, um, the, you know, the ferocity and the disproportionate concentration and the attempt to Nazify, if you like, uh, the state of Israel, uh, the ways in which um, this um, obsessive... Uh, and, and look, there are lots and lots of reasons to feel immense frustration and anger at, and I share some of that, um, at Israeli policies in the West Bank and the dominion over and humiliation of another people, which as Stephen was saying so eloquently in his remarks, runs contrary to the very uh, foundations, in my view at least, of, of Jewish ethics, um, as well as being, in my view, uh, very um, uh, undermining of the state of Israel, if we conceive of the state of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state, which is what its founders saw it to be. But uh, this, as I said, um, obsessive, maniacal uh, attempt to Nazify uh, the state of Israel and to put uh, Jews on campuses in the United States and um, in Britain, uh, place them in a situation where they feel that um, if they go and see a Jewish academic, an Israeli academic who is visiting, they will expose themselves to vilification. Uh, I, I do think in, in you know, significant numbers of instances this um, goes over that fine line. It sort of flows on from what you were saying, but can I get you to reflect on this, the accusation that's levelled at, at Israel, and you write about it in your book, of, mm. of that, it's, that it's creating an apartheid mm. you know, situation. Um, you know, you've sp spent so, so much of your life in South Africa, I think you're well placed to, to, mm. to tackle this idea. Does that analogy, when applied to Israel, make any sense? Well, it makes sense in the sense that there are certainly echoes of apartheid. Uh, uh, you can't <laughs> I mean, you can't travel in the West Bank for very long. I mean, the landscape of the West Bank is a colonial landscape um, in which there are highways that are not to be used or are inaccessible to Palestinians, um, in which there are uh, roads down which they cannot travel because there are roadblocks, um, in which there's a presumed right to enter their homes, ransack their homes, turn them upside down, in which um, the state of laws that is the state of Israel uh, to the west of the Green Line no longer applies. There is no state of laws uh, in the West Bank. And um, there is a systematic, I would argue, uh, humiliation of Palestinians um, in their daily lives, um, which um, echoes apartheid. I mean, apartheid was a systematic system of humiliation uh, and subjugation of another people. Uh, but apartheid was unique to South Africa. It was a South African system codified into a law, um, a whole system erected to, um, to keep uh, a racist system designed to keep uh, the blacks, as I said, far away at the um, horizon. The, um, there is, you know, that does not certainly, I think, apply for example, to the 20% of the Israeli population who are Israeli Arabs. Uh, there is no apartheid uh, within Israel. So there are echoes of apartheid, but it's not apartheid reproduced in the Holy Land. 
Um, this week has been a fairly eventful week in Israeli politics. Moshe Yalon just stepped down as Minister of Defence. Yeah, and, and, and made a very impassioned uh, speech indeed. about the rightward drift and dangerous uh, radicalisation of Israeli politics. And one of the things he said was he's, he felt surprised at a loss of moral compass on basic questions in Israeli society. And I wondered if you could reflect on whether that's a widespread feeling in Israel. I don't think it's a widespread feeling in Israel, or not sufficiently widespread, but it's a truth. You can't have that kind of um, colonial landscape and setup, and the occupation will be a half century old next year, without it being corrupting and corrosive. It is corruptive to corrupting of your moral center. Uh, and you have generations now of IDF soldiers, and they're the only people I mean, Israeli citizens are barred from going to Ramallah. They, you know, I go to Ramallah, but they don't go to Ramallah. They don't, they don't see it. I mean, it's like uh, the people in the, you know, these refugees in these processing centers here. Why are they invisible? Because if people are invisible, eventually the idea is you stop thinking about them. Uh, but the IDF, um, obviously, generations of young conscripts and young officers have gone through the business of this violence, this uh, rampaging through Palestinian homes, subjecting them to uh, humiliating interrogation. Uh, I mean, I remember one of the last times in the West Bank, I was coming back to Jerusalem, and we were going through the main, one of the main gates through the wall back into uh, Israel. And... Um, there were two, there were two, two files, if you like, uh, and uh, and so we were in the right-hand one, and you know, so there were like five cars on on this side of this divider between the two, and the Israeli uh, soldiers just, you know, they just got up and left. You know, it wouldn't have taken anything for somebody to come out and just say, "We're going to close this in a minute." So go left, you know. So with, there was complete chaos because the fight, you know, the cars, you know, it's little things like that. They had to try to back up, and it's, uh, you know, if you if you accumulate that um, sufficiently, it amounts to a life of of humiliation. So I do think, yes, that there has been a corruption of the Israeli body politic. I mean, the very terms are being corrupted. Um, you know, the settler movement likes to portray itself as the modern-day reincarnation of the Zionist settlers of Israel. Um, no, they're doing... They're, they're involved in a lawless enterprise. Um, the Zionist founders of Israel um, uh, were the people behind that declaration, an extract from which we heard at the beginning of this. And um, the rise of Messianic Zionism, the rise of the view that all the real estate between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River is ours. Why is it ours? Because it is. Because it is. Because it was decreed thus um, in the scriptures thousands of years ago. And too bad if there are other people there. The rise of this form of Messianic Zionism over uh, recent decades is, I think, the single most worrying thing for the future of Israel, for the future of a Jewish and democratic Israel, and for the possibility of peace, because as long as that vision prevails, there will be no peace. Three Gaza wars um, in the last several years, you know, you say status quo, and it, it evokes something static, and you might think of something static as something quiet, something peaceful. No, the status quo in Israel is violent because you can hit people over the head once, twice, three times, four times, five times, six times. The seventh time, no. Uh, somebody, something, somebody will say, I don't care. I'm, my life is over, but I'm going to take a couple of Israelis with me or maybe more. And... Um, if you take the position that no two-state peace, and I don't think there's any other form of peace uh, envisageable in Israel, if you take the view that no two-state peace can be reached, then you're accepting that that violent status quo will be 
the Israeli norm, the norm for a country which will continue to have no border. And given that um, Netanyahu's new coalition has just been formed and it's not with the, the centre party but with a, you know, a fairly right wing... Fairly, yeah. Yes, <laughs> be polite. Um, <laughs> what does that mean for Israel's future? I mean, you just touched on it now, but where does that leave Israel in terms of looking ahead for the next, you know, five, ten years? Well, I, I hope that the government doesn't last that long. Uh, I mean, who knows? I don't think it changes things very materially because this was already a very right-wing government. And I think anyway, in the last months of the Obama administration and with the government we currently see in Israel and with the failure of the very intense effort made by Secretary of State Kerry, um, which ended uh, in an unraveling and then the third Gaza war, uh, I think at that point, especially with the ways in which Prime Minister Netanyahu, the ways he has found to insult the President of the United States by going around him to the Congress by very openly supporting Mitt Romney in the last election. I mean, there's a very poisonous uh, relationship between the Prime Minister and the President. And with the failure uh, of that diplomatic effort by the United States, which involved huge investment of resources, very elaborate planning for the security of Israel undertaken by a prominent general, all of it um, uh, just failed. Um, and blame also on the Palestinian side. Uh, both sides failed to take advantage of that um, effort. And so I think, you know, whether or not you have Lieberman as defense minister, uh, you were not going to see in the coming, uh, I would say next year, uh, I don't think, any significant movement uh, toward uh, a two-state outcome. Um, there's talk of President Obama in the last, you know, nine months, I guess, that remained to him, of his drawing up, well, it was drawn up during these talks, but it was never publicized. There's a movement to say the United States should set down the way it sees a two-state peace and, pub and make that public, possibly uh, have it um, in the form of a UN resolution that would then be adopted, um, showing, you know, where... America believes the line should run. Look, I mean, we all know what is required. That's one of the strange things, Michaela, about this situation. And we know that Israel has to give up the vast bulk um, of the settlements in the West Bank. It has to move tens of thousands, possibly, probably uh, more than 100,000, maybe hundreds of thousands of settlers out of the West Bank. There are some... Uh, settlement blocks close to the line that would, uh, could be, you know, with, with territorial swaps, could remain within that. But Israel has to make that decision. Um, and that, obviously, will be um, extremely uh, difficult. On the Palestinian side, uh, the most painful decision is giving up the right of return. Um, the right of return is a uh, is not going to happen. I mean, millions of Palestinians are not going back to Haifa. They're not going back uh, to Petah Tikva. They're not going back to the state of Israel. Um, there should be compensation, negotiations. Yes, all that there can be, but um, the right of return under any peace. Palestinians will go back to Palestine. They will not go back to Israel. And that, again, is a very painful decision. And there has to be some kind of division of Jerusalem which allows the Palestinians to say that some part of Jerusalem is their capital. That, again, is a very, very difficult and painful um, compromise. But at some point, the two peoples have to say, you're here, we're here. Neither of us is going away. We will disagree forever on what happened in 1948. You can have your narrative, the Nakba. We can have our narrative of the foundation of the State of Israel dreamed of for millennia. Um, and it doesn't matter that we have different narratives, so long as we decide that the future is more important, our children are more important, and we don't want this repetitive bloodshed 
anymore. So we're going to create two states for two peoples with these immensely painful compromises. Now, I spent a lot of my childhood in South Africa. Uh, and what did I learn? That the cataclysm that I mentioned, those red with blood swimming pools, it's not inevitable. And when is it not inevitable? When there's leadership. Leadership. And by leadership, I don't mean what we see from Prime Minister Netanyahu or from um, uh, Mahmoud Abbas. That's not leadership. Leadership requires not kicking the can down the road. It requires boldness. It requires what Mandela and de Klerk um, demonstrated. Um, I mean, for Mandela to emerge from prison and take the decisions he took, that is something immense. And millions, tens of millions of people have, have benefited from it. We haven't seen that yet. Um, but, I mean, look at Begin and Sadat at Camp David. I mean, Begin went to Camp David with one core principle. He would never, ever, under any circumstances, give up the settlements in Sinai. He was going to retire there. He announced that he was going to retire to the settlements in Sinai. So that was his red line. But, after 13 days with Sadat at Camp David, he decided that making peace with Egypt was more important than that core principle of his. And the Israeli settlements in, in Sinai were abandoned. And peace was made. It's been a cold peace, but it's still a peace. You don't have hundreds of thousands of Israelis and Egyptians uh, dying anymore uh, since 1978. Uh, all the wars I've covered have ended in a cold peace. In Bosnia is a very cold, chilly, in many ways awful peace. But there hasn't been another shot fired in anger since 1995. And I saw enough people killed uh, in Bosnia to think that that's worthwhile. And I think it's something that must be achieved one day um, in Israel-Palestine. You know, Yehuda Amikai, great Israeli poet, has a poem um, called The Tourists, I think. And there's a group of tourists in Jerusalem and uh, the tour guide is saying, is looking at the, at the old city and saying, um, you see that gate over there? Uh, I'm not quoting verbatim, it's, it's of the 10th century. Um, but that's not important. Just to the left of that gate and down a bit, there sits a man who just bought fruit and vegetables for his family. Um, and it's a beautiful thought. I mean, history is all very well, and we can feud over history. Um, and it happens. Um, I saw it in Bosnia. I've seen it elsewhere. It certainly happens in the Middle East. But you've got to put fruit and vegetables on the table for your family. And the only way you make sure those children... I mean, I've seen children in Gaza who are 10 years old, and they've been through three wars. What are they going to think of Israel? What are they going to do one day? Um, and these are the issues that are not addressed by the current leaders. This is a good moment for us to open the floor up to questions. We have a roving microphone that is coming down now, so we'll just wait till it comes to you. There's a gentleman, we'll start with you up the back and then we'll come down to the front. And if we can keep our questions more question-like and less observational, we can sure. get through more of them and that no, would be great. No, that's no problem. Um, you mentioned three Gaza wars. Now, Israel... I'm, I'm talking about the arguments we always get. Israel withdrew from Gaza. We know what the Gazans did. They took the infrastructure that was left. They destroyed it and fired rockets. Even now, the few building materials that are getting into Gaza, instead of going to the hospitals and schools, are being used for new tunnels. So what do you suggest in terms of making peace with that uh, facet of the Palestinian leadership? And well, there are immense problems on the Palestinian side. It's a divided Palestinian national movement with uh, Fatah, which is corrupt uh, uh, in the West Bank and uh, has lost the support of many the Palestinian people in the West Bank, uh, uh, personal enrichment of many Fatah leaders, uh, uh, statements from Mahmoud Abbas that uh, there's going to be reconciliation with Hamas, it's just hot air, 
the laities that come to absolutely nothing. And uh, I mean, I was in Gaza about 16 months ago. I mean, there are still Hamas leaders who, I mean, I spoke to one who said, well, why can't you just take the six million Jews and put them in America? And of course, the vile Hamas charter still exists. And I mean, there are more pragmatic uh, Hamas people too. The actual, you know, what happened in Gaza, like everything in this conflict after 2005 is, is disputed. If I've spoken a couple of times with Jim Wolfenson, the former president of the World Bank, who was charged with trying to turn Gaza into a viable economy after that withdrawal. And he, he believes that Israel did everything it could uh, to undermine uh, the prospects for that uh, Gazan economy. And well, you can take however much of that. Uh, I mean, I don't think Jim Wolfenson has any particular reason to say that uh, if it weren't true. Um, but clearly the withdrawal uh, resulted. And then there's no democratic legitimacy either on the Palestinian side. There hasn't been an election for 11 years. We have no idea what the real alignment uh, of forces is uh, on the Palestinian side. Um, so there are problems, but when the Palestinians came up with a leader who said, enough of narratives, enough of history, if we want a state, let's build a state, let's get, a, get rid of corruption, uh, let's make the West Bank viable, to the point that the World Bank in 2011 said, declared, after a thorough inquiry, that the West Bank was ready for statehood. When that leader, Salam Fayyad, came along, spoke very good English, educated at the University of Texas, worked at the IMF for a long time. He, for Prime Minister Netanyahu, was the Palestinian from hell. The Palestinian from hell. Why? Because he was plausible. He was a plausible interlocutor. And the argument, which you've just given, sir, in modified form, is always that there's nobody for us to talk to. There is no interlocutor. And I'd be prepared to believe that if I thought that Israel had, had in recent years at least, uh, tried in good faith uh, to negotiate. On the contrary, when Fad was there, everything was done to portray him as a unilateralist uh, who didn't really want to make peace. And Fatah also marginalized him because he wanted to clean up government and he wanted to get rid of the corruption. So. I'm not saying so. I mean, I take your point. There are huge problems with the Palestinian national movement, above all the divisions in it. But I don't think Netanyahu goes home at night and says to his wife, damn it, darling, another day without making progress on peace with the Palestinians. No, he says, you know what, sweetheart? We just kicked the can down the road for another six months. And that's the reality. It's a very um, sad reality. I've got a question down the front, and then I'll have to come to a question over here. Uh, over here. Sorry. Yes, sir. Hi. Yeah. Uh, if you were in control of Israel, as at this moment, what would you do? What would be some of the steps you'd implement? <laughs> Very powerful, Roger. Go. Uh, yeah, that, well, I, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, well, for a start, in the West Bank, I would uh, try to get rid of you know, some of the day-to-day -day and I, I think unnecessary humiliation to Palestinians. Uh, uh, there's a whole area, Area C, which the, uh, you know, Israel is continuing to control. Uh, I would make it possible for Israelis to go to the West Bank. I would lift, um, I, I don't think it should be illegal for Israelis to, I mean, the whole design of the wall and of these measures is again to disappear the Palestinian people and, um, uh, and, I think that, um, you know, I think that there has to be negotiation. Um, there has to be negotiation and uh, it's, that negotiation should be undertaken at a start, as a starting point with those Palestinians who are ready for a two-state compromise. That would be uh, in the West Bank uh, and try to build um, toward compromises on those you know, very painful issues that I described. It would be, I think America has to be involved, uh, the European Union has to be involved, and you know, the Arab world is forever saying, uh, you, know, you have this curious situation now where Israeli geostrategic view of the Middle East often sounds very like the Saudi view, in, in that Iran, you know, Iran is the shared enemy. 
uh, well, you know, are the Arab states ready to step up with the plate to the plate and actually, you know, recognize Israel and be supportive of a peace negotiation um, if Israel, you know, begins that in good faith? Um, the thing is that with this government, um, well, under my government, it would happen. So. <laughs> There's a question over on this side, I think. There's a gentleman there, and then we'll, and then we'll move back across. Hi. Um, do you think current Israel wants peace? Are you talking about the government? Yeah. No. You might take the next question, I think. Right. I, I think... Uh, I think in, I think the, the current government wants to, con wants to continue to control all the land of, uh, between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. Uh, who in Israel do you think would sorry. Ah. be of... Oh, sorry. Who in Israeli um, political life do you think would be a viable leader? Well, I think part of the tragedy of Israel, uh, and look, there's a very vibrant, you know, Israeli economic miracle. Uh, you know, it's a very admirable society in many regards. But the tragedy of Israel, I think, was the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin uh, by a messianic Zionist um, of the kind I described 21 years ago today. And it was a very, very effective assassination. It undermined and, in fact, destroyed the Oslo peace process. And it removed from Israel the one character, who, the one man who, because he'd fought all the wars uh, and because he hated Arafat, he really hated him. And yet, and yet, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen The Gatekeepers, the movie, but again, you see it there, all these and they're all men, all these men who have devoted their lives to the security of the state of Israel, they come to a point, as Rabin did, where they say, this is just not tenable ad infinitum. We cannot go on trying to find informers, trying to know what goes on in that house, and that house, and that house, and that house, trying to control the lives of millions of people. It's not tenable. And that is why, uh, with great reluctance, uh, Ravine made the brave choice to shake the hand of a man he hated and try to uh, make peace. And of course, Ben-Gurion said um, in the 50, early 50s, he said, peace is more important than real estate. And that, uh, it was also the view that Rabin came to, but he was assassinated. So I think... You know, what is always uppermost in Israeli minds, with reason, security. It's not a, it's a rough neighborhood. Um, so I think the profile of a potential leader would be um, a general uh, in, the, in the Labour Party. Um, and there are, you know, there are a couple of such characters um, sort of in the mix, but um, I think it has, it has to be somebody who can reassure Israels, Israelis um, that they will be secure, that peace will bring greater security, not less security. Um, and there needs to be renewal on the Palestinian side too. I know that wasn't your question, but Abbas is 81 now. I don't think, you know, that's, that's not the future. We are, um, we, we are, we started a bit late, so we're going to keep going a little bit, um, but we've only probably got time for a few more, so you might need to ask Roger in the foyer. But we'll just take a question in the middle here. Are, uh, yep. are you one of those Americans who will depart the US Trump? Ah, <laughs> uh, the Trump question. <laughs> did, did, everyone, got, did everyone, did people hear the question? We got, how, how, well, we got more than an hour into this without those two DT words being uh, pronounced. Um, yeah, the joke is the, that the real wall is being built along the Canadian border because there would be such a massive exodus. Um, um, no, I would, uh, I, would, 
I'm an American who would stay in the United States and fight to preserve the freedoms and democracy, the, the world's oldest democracy um, uh, of the United States. But I do think, um, and this is the corollary of your question, that um, Donald Trump is dangerous. He's not dangerous for what he says because he changes what he says the whole time and, um, and he doesn't have any firm beliefs. His only belief is Donald Trump. He's an egomaniac. Um, and presumably, if elected, which I still think is unlikely, but not impossible, uh, he would surround himself, presumably, with some at least semi-competent people. But what is very dangerous about Trump is he's a TV huckster, basically. He's got a, a mob behind him uh, right now. And um, he, as I said, he's an egomaniac. He's a bully. And he has a very, very tenuous relationship with truth-telling. In fact, probably a non-existent relationship with truth-telling. And you put those three things together um, with the nuclear codes and the amount of power. You know, somebody will tell him he's got stubby fingers and the next minute he'll have nuked Denmark. And that's, you know, that's a worrying um, scenario. I think the personality is he's impulse-driven. Uh, he says he wants an unpredictable United States. Um, uh, so I think he's dangerous, yeah. And, uh, you know, I think he's, look, he's the anti-Obama. I mean, Obama's the prudent, intellectual, doesn't really understand the theater of politics, doesn't, you know, can be very flat sometimes in emotional situations, um, doesn't glad hand, doesn't do the golf game. And uh, Trump, and, you know, many Americans view him as a kind of European social democrat, and they don't like that. And in some ways he is. Um, and Trump is all America. And it's all theater. And he's channeling various forms of anger. And uh, as I said, um, you know, there's, there's kind of a mob-like following right now. Uh, we'll see. I mean, one of the issues is that Hillary... Uh, Hillary Clinton is a candidate with problems, as, as Bernie Sanders has revealed. The gentleman in the blue shirt, directly in the middle here. So we can get, do you want to pass the microphone just to this gentleman here? So we, are, we have gone over time, but if you guys are happy, we'll keep going for a little bit longer. Great. Do I get over time? Uh, thank you. Um, although Israel is a democratic country and only the Israelis can vote, the Jews in the world are still affected by Israel's stance. Um, besides J Street and NIF and so on, shouldn't there maybe be a, a world jury who is given the opportunity to at least voice its opinion? Well, I think diaspora Jews do you know, voice their opinion. I mean, in the United States, by far the strongest movement is APAC, and APAC's position has generally been um, Israel right or wrong. Um, don't criticize Israel. If you criticize Israel, you play into the hands of the enemies of Israel. And there was really no place for Jews who are Zionists, who support the state of Israel, but who feel that Israel is engaged in a very self-destructive course that has become an aberration, uh, which is this 50-year-old occupation. And J Street uh, has emerged in the last few years at a very rapid pace um, to fill that void to, to some degree. Uh, there is now a place in the United States for Jews who are critical of some Israeli policies, but who support the Jewish democratic state of Israel to raise their voices. And I think... Yeah, it is very important that Jews around the world make their views known. And there's also an issue in the United States in that young American Jews are increasingly alienated by Israeli policies or don't identify with Israel as much as they did. And the possible scenario is that um, the ardent supporters of Israel, you know, 10, 20 years out, will be overwhelmingly from the orthodox community. And um, I think there is an issue for Israel of, um, of 
being more isolated from European Jews and American Jews if the current policy course persists. Taking that point of diminishing support amongst young people, uh, absent that sort of support in the medium term, to what degree would that affect American foreign policy and its support of Israel? That's a good question. Um, look, you, you know, Trump has made a lot of saying that Obama has been no friend of Israel. Well, no friend of Israel to the tune of $20 billion in military aid since 2008. No friend of Israel, uh, more than a billion dollars for the Iron Dome defense system. No friend of Israel blocking, I think, 18 resolutions in the United Nations that were deemed biased against Israel. Uh, you know, this is an outrageous allegation. Uh, President Obama has been a solid uh, supporter of Israel to the point that the United States has even vetoed pretty much the president's words in Cairo in 2009 about the settlements, which shows the perversity of American domestic politics when it comes uh, to Israel. Um, look, I think um, you might find the United States over time taking a different attitude in, in the United Nations. And, uh, you know, Israel might be able to rely less on support, on, you know, resolutions like on the settlements. I don't think, at least in, not in the immediate term, and uh, the idea that the United States is going to start cutting off military aid to Israel, I think is very hard to imagine, certainly given the current makeup of the Congress. Um, that is not going to fly. So, um, you know, the United States will continue to have Israel's back, but there will be, I think it's risky if Israel just continues on the current course, let's say, for another 15 years. Um, I think patience could run out. The gentleman in the red shirt has been waiting for a while. Pass the mic back. And then we'll come to the gentleman in the white shirt at the end. Uh, thank you. You mentioned that one of the reasons you moved to America was because as a Jew you could be loud and public in your Jewishness in America. But in the last few days we've seen the editor of your newspaper, Jonathan Wiseman, uh, receive a barrage of anti-Semitic uh, attacks uh, from Trump supporters. And what I'm wondering is, is um, your ability to be a, a vocal Jew, is it restricted to New York and is there a latent anti-Semitism in the rest of the country which we're now starting to see come about? Well, I mean, as you know, sir, there's anti-Semitism everywhere. I mean, it exists in some form pretty much. I don't think, you know, we know that from, from history. Uh, he's not the editor of, of, of the New York Times. He's a journalist um, at the Times. And uh, he tweeted a piece by Robert Kagan from the Washington Post um, comparing Trump to fascist leaders in Europe. And Kagan is a very serious man who knows Europe. And, um, you know, freedom doesn't go in one fell swoop. It goes piece by piece. And you see Republicans now who'd said they would never support Trump falling into line one by one. And you see the, the barrier moving, you know, over what Trump what is acceptable, what Trump can say, who will support him. You know, people are jumping on the bandwagon and uh, you don't have to read very deep into history to see, you know, the potential dangers of that. Um, there are, as we've seen from those tweets, there are anti-Semites among his supporters. I don't think it's widespread in the United States. Um, I think it exists in the United States. Uh, I would rather be a Jew in the United States uh, than any other country um, uh, in the world, apart from, I mean, I think I, I would feel, I mean, in Israel, uh, too. Uh, I would, I mean, in Israel, a lot of the moral dilemmas I've been discussing today would become immediate daily dilemmas because I would be engaged in trying to uh, change Israeli policies day to day. But I think America is still... Um, a very good country to be to be a Jew and live your Jewishness uh, in whatever form you want to live it uh, in a very open um, uh, vocal way. Look, 
New York City is a Jewish city uh, uh, to a very great degree. That's not the case of uh, Cleveland or Kansas, but um, I don't think there's, I haven't encountered um, anti-Semitism in America in any significant degree. Gentleman in the white shirt at the end. What are your thoughts on on the mainstream media such as um, Washington Times, BBC, CNN, New York Times, portraying the whole narrative or the biases in the headlines and the stories and not not conveying the story as it is? And what can you do about it? Being the thing is about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is that those words you just used, the story as it is, mean diametrically opposite things in the mouths of different people. Um, There is no story as it is. There there is a situation and everybody has a different view of it and everybody or a lot of people have a passionately held view of uh, how different it is. So, you know, I was foreign editor and so I was running the coverage like of the second intifada and, you know, you get vilified by the Palestinian side, you get vilified by the Israeli side. Um, as long as you're being vilified by both, maybe. I believe that we, you know, the New York Times at least, tries in good faith to present a fair and balanced picture of uh, what is going on in Israel Palestine. Um, you, sir, uh, others, some may believe here in the audience that we are too favorable to Israel, some may believe we're too favorable to the Palestinians. I think, um, you know, I think everybody at the paper is trying to uh, report in a way that is balanced. But do we fall short sometimes? Sure we do. Do we make mistakes? Yes, we make mistakes. And I've never really, you know, objectivity. What is objectivity? We're all, you know, we all have our sensibilities. We all have our beliefs. Fairness is one thing. I mean, talk to one side, talk to the other side, try to be fair to both sides. But objectivity, I think, is, is unattainable because we are individuals. We, are, we bring our individuality to... I mean, Michaela brings it to her journalism. I bring it to my journalism. And uh, um, so a lot of people spend a lot of time and energy and money trying to demonstrate that major um, publications or institutions are biased one way or another. I think the New York Times does its best. Am I troubled sometimes by the BBC? Yes, I am. I think uh, sometimes there's a tone toward Israel that is, that is just hostile and consistently hostile in ways that trouble me. And, um, but again, you know, it's a tough story I can assure you, sir, if you went out there as a correspondent and you filed your first dispatch, you would have thousands of people <laughs> le- leaping on you and telling you that you got it all wrong, whatever you wrote. So it's a tough assignment. We're going to take one more question in the front row. Oh, the microphone's coming down to you. Is a powerful rabbinate destructive to the democratic future of the State of Israel? Uh, Well, first of all, I want to thank the audience because we've gotten through an hour and 15 minutes and nobody has pronounced the word Iran. And um, I've spent a huge amount of my time (laughs) talking about the Iran nuclear deal over the last couple of years. So thank you for that. Um, I I think it is, yes, I do. I mean, I think if you want a more inclusive um, uh, Israeli society, then the power of the rabbinate, the fact that Jews and non-Jews can't get married in the state of Israel, um, um, you know, that is is troubling to me. I mean, that's not the Israel uh, I would like to see. It's not a field uh, I'm deeply versed in. I'm not... Um, a religious Jew myself, but clearly the growing uh, religious identification of a lot of the IDF officers, um, uh, this has troubled some conscripts and uh, troubled, you know, their view of of, uh, an Israel that should control all of the territory um, has, has caused some problems. So yes, I think the answer to your question is yes. 
I'm about to invite Ronnie Khan to the stage to give a vote of thanks. But before I do, could I get you, firstly, thank you all for supporting the NIF, but also please join me in thanking Roger Cohen for a fantastic hour and a half. Roger. Oh, is this working? Yes. Um, on behalf of NIF, I really want to thank you. I came back this week, in fact yesterday, from both South Africa and London, so feel very connected to the places that you mentioned. I was not in America, so I can't talk about America. Having read your book um, and listening to you tonight, clearly, one, you are a passionate friend of Israel, believer, and clearly you state for all of us the challenges we all feel about the, the lack of democratization of Israel. And it is a challenge. So I want to thank you for enunciating it so clearly for us and making us aware again of the fact that each and every one of us has a story. Both sides have a story and it's really important for us to remember that. But when somebody in the audience asked how can we support and have a voice for Israel? I do really believe that NIF is one of the ways that we all can support Israel today because what NIF stands for, as Liam so clearly stated, is for the very important values that I would hope each and every one of us believe in. So we do have an avenue right here that we can support Israel in a very positive way. But thank you so much for sharing your story. I'd read your book. Visiting South Africa again was an eye-opener. Um, but thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you.